Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Functional Nutrition Podcast. Today, we have got a fantastic guest. This is Rob Wolf. Many of you guys have probably heard of Rob. He is one of the you wanted the original spokesperson for the paleo diet. In fact, he wrote a book called The Paleo Solution, which I believe was like a New York Times bestseller, a real popular book, and got paleo with the paleo diet on the map. Uh, you know, and he's he's um, also done a lot of work with keto, and he's also written a couple other great books, Wired to Eat, and also his new book, Sacred Cow. We're going to talk about all of those. We're also going to talk about regenerative farming and the best health strategies that you can apply into your life today. And so, Rob, welcome to the podcast. Huge honor to be here. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I heard about paleo just like everybody else, probably in the natural health movement when it started really picking up. And it was right around the time you wrote your book in 2010. And so let's go into your story and how you kind of came across the paleo diet. Yeah. So I'll try to keep it brief. It's a 22 year story. So <laughs> it, it, I can, I can ramble on. And uh, I think I'm reaching that, that point also where I've told this story enough where I'm always wondering if I've already said what I'm currently saying. There's kind of that deja vu piece, <laughs> piece to it. And so I, it may be a sign of dementia or something setting in, but uh, I, I'm a biochemist by training. That's what my undergrad was in. And I was kind of looking at potentially doing uh, a, a research track and autoimmunity and cancer research, more of like a naturopathy track or potentially a, a conventional medicine track. I was intrigued by all of them. Uh, all of them had different draws for me. And I, I, I'm a former California state powerlifting champion from way, way back, way, way back. And <laughs> so I've always been interested in kind of health and human performance Neither of my parents, unfortunately, were particularly healthy, so they had a lot of health issues. And early on, I kind of had this sneaky idea that if you ate better and exercised and whatnot, that you could you could live a better life. And so I, I've always tinkered with things a lot. And it was around this this time, right around 1996 up through 1998, that I was really shifting from kind of a a classic like powerlifting, high protein, high carb diet into more of a, a vegan, plant based diet. And I know it works well for some people, but for, for me, I really was kind of a diehard in that um, I felt like you should eat whole foods, whole foods only, and that should carry the day. Like I shouldn't need a bunch of supplements. I shouldn't need to, you know, do a bunch of stuff beyond that. And I'm about 165, 170 pounds right now. Um, I developed ulcerative colitis so bad that I got down to about 125, 130 pounds. Wow. So if you imagine like 30 pounds less of me, that that's kind of where I was. And I was absolutely at my wits end. And uh, I, I knew enough about medicine and health that um, the treatment options before me for ulcerative colitis kind of sucked. Like yeah, they, it, nothing good was going to, was going to come of it. Yeah. They wanted to do a bowel resection. There was right. maybe the corticosteroids, the immunosuppressant drugs, like none of it is good long-term. And then interestingly, it was right around this time that my mom who had suffered from lifelong health issues that now looking back are, it, it's kind of obvious. She had celiac disease. She had, um, five or six different interrelated autoimmune diseases, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, like on and on and on. But her rheumatologist had run some, some interesting, particularly for that time, uh, kind of food sensitivity testing. And he said to my mom, you're, you're reactive to grains, legumes, and dairy. And she wow. told me this. this is the late 90s? This, this was late 90s. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and, and there's kind of a bit of irony in this. My wife, who grew up in a town about 30 miles uh, south of where I grew up, her mother also had rheumatoid arthritis, had the same rheumatologist, and he didn't run the same testing on her. Wow. And, and it, it, it's kind of interesting, but we have kind of an interesting back, back channel story on that. But when my mom told me this, because I was vegan at the time, I was kind of like, okay, no dairy. That makes sense from, you know, the, the no dairy perspective. But I was like, no grains, no legumes. Like, what on earth do you eat <laughs> if you don't eat that, you know? And I was literally sitting outside. It was a rare sunny day in Seattle, which is where I was wearing, living at that time. And I was just kind of free associating and I was like, okay, grains, legumes, dairy, that's like agriculture. What did we eat before agriculture and, you know, hunter gatherers. And then I had heard of this term paleolithic diet. And I had no idea where I had heard of it, 
But I, I went into the house, fired up the computer, waited for the dial-up to do its thing. And there was this new fangled search engine called Google. And into Google, I put Paleolithic Diet. And there was not a ton of info, but there were two main, main folks, uh, Lauren Cordain and another guy, Arthur Devaney, had written quite a, a, for that time, quite a bit of material about this. And most of it focused on like gut and autoimmune related issues. And I was kind of like, wow, this is, this is kind of crazy, you know? And I was so sick at this point that I was kind of like, I, I've got nothing to lose. And honestly, if shifting to a more, you know, meat centric diet kills me, then that may be for the better because I mean, my, my life was, was miserable at that point. So I, I shifted into a lower carb keto, you know, uh, paleo type diet. I've played with iterations over over the years, trying to um, improve my metabolic flexibility to include more carbs. And I'm just it, both on genetic testing and just empirically, like I run really well on fat and protein. I can throw in a little bit of carbs here and there. I can tolerate a little bit more in the summer than in the winter, but I just do pretty well with that. And uh, it, it, that was 22 years ago that that I kind of made that that personal discovery continued to do research on the topic and it, it possibly interesting also uh, in 2000 I found on the interwebs this weird workout called CrossFit and my my friend Dave Warner and I started doing that he's a retired Navy SEAL and about three or four months after we started doing it in, in, in his garage we had about 15 people that we were training and they loved it and so we reached out to the founders of CrossFit uh, Greg and Lauren Glassman, we said, hey, we like doing this. Can we open a gym, call it CrossFit? And they said, sure, do it. Uh, there were no contracts. There was no affiliate agreement. <laughs> I mean, this was really early on, yeah. but that was the first CrossFit affiliate, CrossFit North. And wow. then I moved back down to Chico, California about a year later and opened what was then the fourth affiliate in the world, CrossFit NorCal, and worked with uh, the, the CrossFit folks for a good number of years. And I had a pretty cool opportunity to to see, you know, what are the needs of elite athletes? What are the needs of people dealing with different health concerns? Um, what are my own blind spots? Like what are my biases and where do those fail people and, and cease to serve them in, in trying yeah. to help them reach their goals? And I've always gravitated more towards that um, gut health, metabolic disease, you know, kind of, kind of track. Like I, I feel like if I can, can help somebody dial in their sleep, their food, their stress levels, get them exercising in a, a way that's appropriate for them, it can literally save their life. And so that's really been my, my passion and uh, wrote a couple of New York Times bestselling books. Like there really wasn't a paleo diet yeah. section before my, my book right. hit. So I've been really, really fortunate and uh, probably a combination of, of hard work and some really good luck, good, good luck, good timing, being at the right place at the right time. Yeah. Right. And CrossFit really took off and paleo and CrossFit really almost Just was married. In lived a sense. Yeah. and died together. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Now let's talk about what the paleo diet is and really like a, like a template. Obviously you mentioned grains, right? Taking grains out. So let's go into a little bit more about what the paleo diet really consists of. Yeah. You, you know, the, maybe the easiest way to describe the dietary part of it is it by exclusion. So yeah. we, we generally are removing grains, legumes, and dairy. And so mm -hmm. then by extension, we're looking at meat, seafood, fruits, vegetables, roots, shoots, tubers. Um, it, it starts sounding like kind of a, an odd religion though, because people are like, well, is quinoa a seed or a, right. it, you know, and it, it, it gets <laughs> squirrely there. And for me, uh, very early on, what, what I noticed was that if we could just get people, what they needed was like a, a home base. Like I think about when, when you're kids and you play tag, like you have this, this yeah. safe base to go back to. Um, so many folks, like they had never in their lives gone five days, 10 days to say nothing of a month without eating gluten or dairy or nightshades or, you know, whatever. And, and so, so many of the chronic diseases that we see that people just take to be normal, like uh, an acid reflux and joint pain and, and uh, acne and, you know, a whole host of things, pretty good indicator that, that they're, they're largely diet and lifestyle related. And so what I found was that if I could get people to do this, basically an, an elimination diet, around kind of paleo principles, run it for 30 days. It was short enough that most people, you could kind of guilt them or cajole them into doing it for 30 days. It's like, come on, you know, like you can, you yeah. can do this for 30 days. 
but it was it was long enough for folks to get really stunning results and feel better. And then I would tell them, reintroduce all those things, one food at a time. And it was kind of an eye-opening for people. They're like, I really am reactive to gluten or I really am reactive to cow dairy, but not goat dairy. And so it was, it was cool um, being able to use this elimination diet approach built around these paleo principles. And I, I really do have to say that um, although the, the paleo diet as, as it, you know, as it has historically been understood has kind of waned in popularity, things like um, Whole30, which is basically right. built around the same templates, but provides some, some more structure on it has kind of gone on and has helped a, a good number of people. And it, it's worth mentioning that things like circadian biology, early time restricted eating, and also the gut microbiome really got put into prominence yeah. because of the paleo diet concept. Like that was really the genesis for the researchers who are now looking at those topics today they will all credit like the work of Lauren Cordain and other folks in that early paleo diet research community for putting that topic on their radar. Yeah. So interesting. You know, I, I really made a lot of diet changes. I have a similar story. I had actually had irritable bowel syndrome. So okay. I didn't have ulcerative colitis, but I ended up losing 30 pounds as well. Had orthostatic mm. hypotension, um, you know, just extreme fatigue. And this is around 2004, 2005. I was in graduate school and I came across the maker's diet by Jordan mm -hmm. Rubin which a lot of similar principles, right? Super simple. Started yeah. making a lot of diet changes, started doing intermittent fasting before I even knew what it was. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because I was taking exercise physiology courses and uh, my teacher would always say, you know, you got to start your morning, right? With this amount of calories, right? And I ended up gaining that weight back by time-restricted feeding and mm -hmm. more or less what we called it at that point, a healing diet. So we took out all the grains, right? Legumes, went low carb, and uh, I would do some carb backloading, but it would mm -hmm. be like sweet potatoes and things like that. I didn't even know these terms back then, but it, it was it allowed me to regain my health back in you know the mid two thousands. And it's interesting how all of this has come along and evolved. And you know your next book, Wired to Eat, you did a lot of research on people's unique responses, blood sugar particularly responses to food. So let's talk a little bit about that. I should, if I'm a if had been a better marketer, I could have had like the paleo solution for cats and dogs and old people and young people. And you, you know, like uh, I love Barry Sears, but like he he really wore the yeah. tires off of you know iterations off of his own concept. <laughs> And I didn't want to do that. I, I really, if I did something new, um, I, f funny enough, like this is how naive I, I was when I published uh, the Paleo Solution. I was like, this is going to answer all the problems. Like I'm going to have to work for a different line of work, you know, like I'm, I'm done. Like this will go out there and it'll change the world. And I, I've got maybe a year and I was super foolish in, in that. Um, it, it, it definitely has helped people. And, you know, we, we continue to grow and evolve and everything, but um with Wired to Eat, I really wanted something that was qualitatively different than what I had put forward in the Paleo Solution. It, it still definitely has a, a strong paleo diet kind of kind of center to it. But there were two things that that popped up that I found really interesting. And, and one of them was a, a paper from a guy that unfortunately died before I could I could get him on my podcast. He's a researcher out of Georgia. Um, I'm blanking on his last name, a, 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 a Greek guy by by heritage. But he wrote this paper, um, uh, The uh, Determinants of Brain Evolution, The Omnivore's Real Dilemma. And he talked about kind of the evolution of the neuroregulation of appetite and these, these ideas around all organisms on the planet are wired to consume the most nutrient-dense food sources that they can. And uh, generally, that means protein-rich foods, like whether you're talking about grazing animals preferring clover over grass, um, it, it always is this kind of consistency in, in seeking out nutrient density. And then there's a flip side to this. While we, we seek out food density and novelty, we also have a tendency to get bored. All organisms get bored with the, mm. the food that they're eating, so they want a certain amount of variety. And this makes sense from... Uh, uh, diversifying the nutrients that we get, but also from a toxicity standpoint, like as awesome as blueberries are, blueberries have some toxic substances in them. And if you overate them, they could maybe overwhelm one part of your liver detoxification pathway. And, and so the, this combination, which is so fascinating and it made so much sense, 
And it, it, the thing for me that really struck was that it made the case that living the way that we are wired to eat, which is where the, the, the term for the book came from, the way that we're genetically hardwired to eat. If you live in the modern world and you are not sick and diabetic and broken, you're kind of screwing up in a way. Like you could make that case from an evolutionary perspective, like you're, you're doing something other than eating every little bit of food that you can and then doing as little activity as you can, which is the reason why our species is here. That's what our ancestors did. And it was just so powerful to me because I was like, it's not our fault. Like this situation we are in, the difficulty that people have losing weight, regaining their health, like it's really not our fault. And so it, it was for me, this very powerful kind of emotionally liberating perspective. And I found that interesting, but I'm like, okay, that's interesting, but it's not a whole book. And so I kept noodling on that and, and kind of collating research. And then a, a piece came out of the Weizmann Institute out of Israel, where they looked at the differing blood glucose responses to people eating different foods. And it was a beautifully um, performed study. They, they had a thousand people, they did a gut microbiome analysis, a genetic analysis, lipidology, um, really complex machine learning algorithms applied to all this. And then they started feeding these people different meals. And what was crazy is uh, historically, uh, we assumed that the glycemic response for different foods were the same to all people. Like garbanzo beans, because they're a highly complex carb, should have a low glycemic response. Even if you ate a lot, your blood glucose in theory wouldn't go that high. Um, cookies and bananas in theory would spike blood glucose levels in everybody. And what they found with this research is that the, those, those assumptions were wrong um, from one person to the other. They, they had these great comparisons where like one patient, one, one participant would eat a, a banana and their blood glucose was just flat. It was like they drank water. They had no response, which is great. Like they, yeah. their body handled it fantastically. The same person would eat a chocolate chip cookie though and their blood sugar went to the moon. And then they had people that had the exact opposite, the chocolate chip cookie, they metabolized great. And then the banana sent them to the moon and apples and, you know, it was just all over the map. And this started, it, it, it put into context what I had seen clinically, which was that it was just a, a crapshoot how people responded to different mm. foods. And so I developed this thing called the seven day carb test, where we would pick a battery of carbohydrates, have people eat them a specific amount at a specific time, um, check blood glucose at one hour and two hours. And if your blood glucose went above 115 uh, milligrams per deciliter, then maybe either that's a, a carb that we don't like, or maybe we want to cut the amount in half, or maybe do it after a workout or what have you. But it, it, it provided some guidelines for, well, maybe you're someone like me who just doesn't do great with carbs across the board, or maybe um, you do great with chickpeas and rice, but you don't do well with wheat bread and bananas. And so it was right. a way of really getting very customized on the dietary intervention while also, a you know, addressing all of the emotional baggage that comes along with, mm -hmm. with changing diet and lifestyle behaviors. So uh, I, I was proud of both books, but I, I really, um, I learned so much in the ten, almost 10 years between the first book and yeah. the second book. Like I, I was really pretty tickled with um, Wired to Eat. And the, the cool thing with that is it, it's been successful, but it's really been adopted by practitioners. Um, right. Functional medicine, health coaches, doctors, dietitians. Like it, it, it's really um, caught kind of a slipstream within those circles because I think it provides a, sim, a, a framework that they can then go back to their patients and clients and be able to kind of start unpacking what's happening with folks and do it on a very individualized level. Yeah, and it's really utilizing more of the hormone model uh, when it comes to how your body's responding to foods, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there that are calories in, calories out, as long as, you know, you eat this amount of calories, you burn this amount of calories, you're going to lose weight, or you're going to have, you know, a good health outcome. And th the variability of things really tells us that's different, right? It's really yeah. more so about how much insulin is circulating in your bloodstream because we know insulin is a fat storage hormone. So you're not going to be able to burn fat. You're going to have more inflammation in your system uh, when insulin's high. So we want to avoid the kind of foods that are spiking our blood sugar, at least minimize those uh, or strategically use them. Like you mentioned, like right after yeah. a workout or something like that. 
And so I think that's that's keen. And you were doing this back when it before continuous blood glucose monitoring, right? Have you experimented with that? Because that's just recently become more available. Yeah, you know when we um, when we released Wired to Eat, there was there had been for two. So it, it was released in 2016. Um, we had heard rumors that the Apple Watch could perform real time blood glucose monitoring. Yeah. And we kept just waiting, hoping, because I was <laughs> hoping that this thing would come live and then yeah. people wouldn't need to do the uh, the finger prick test and, and everything. But it still hasn't uh, been manifest. And it, it's, uh, I know there are some out there, some folks out there like uh, Levels and some other yeah, companies levels. that are now making it much more easy to, to get um, CGMs into folks, uh, you know, use. I think they're great. The, the, uh, the CGMs are great for... Uh, uh, seeing trends, um, the the variability though, like how accurate they are, there can be some lag time yeah. and some other issues with that. Uh, interestingly, I'm reasonably lean. And so the CGMs uh, are kind of calibrated for folks that are a little bit on the heavier side. And so if you're leaner, you actually get more error within the, the mm. readings, which can be a little bit challenging. But I think that they're really valuable tools and somebody will get in and, and tweak the algorithms to address lean people so that we get right. you know more accuracy and precision on that. But I, I think that they're an amazing uh, tool for, you know, because you slap it on once and then you can, you can track yourself for two or three weeks just off that one go. Yeah. Yeah. My wife and I have used them and my wife noticed that we saw maple syrup. So she had um, like these kind of paleo pancakes mm -hmm. and she did honey on it. Great. You know, blood sugar didn't move did maple syrup on it, boom, blood sugar jumped up. Interesting. And wow. for me, it, for me, it had more to do with caffeine. Hmm. So if I had- that stress response? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if I had coffee with around 100 milligrams of caffeine, my blood sugar was high all day. Hmm. And if, if it was more like 50 milligrams of caffeine, blood sugar was super solid. And, and I also actually noticed that too with cravings right? Because normally it's easy for me to fast. I can do a 24 hour fast, no problem. When I had more caffeine, which for a period of time I was doing that. And also, of course, you know, effect, also sleep quality too. When I didn't right. sleep as good, that definitely affected it. Yeah. Um, so that was an interesting thing that I noticed. Are, are you a slow metabolizer on I caffeine? believe so. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So 50 milligrams, about 50 milligrams, I feel great with. And I can do that. And also I put magnesium in it now too. Okay. So I take magnesium, a little bit of salts with the coffee and it seems to work great. And, and for context for folks, that's like a quarter of a normal small espresso or, right. or Americano. <laughs> small <laughs> amount. <of> Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and right. we've, we are now doing like, uh, we make, we, we have a coffee pot or a French, French press, but we'll do um, six scoops of decaf two scoops of calf. Mm. And so yeah. I'm, I'm the same boat, like I'm a slow metabolizer and it, it, it yeah. wreaks havoc on my sleep. And everything yeah, that's else. actually a really good idea because coffee, obviously you got a lot of antioxidants in mm -hmm. there, blood sugar, stabilizing benefits with chlorogenic and caffeic acid. Yeah. And it just feels good, right? It's yeah. not, it's, it's enjoyable, especially in the colder months of the year. Yeah. Um, but you know, you want to be able to get that right. When you get hit the caffeine at the right amount, you feel amazing. And when you yeah. overdo it, or, you know, if you underdo it, um, you know, you don't get those benefits. And, and of course, once you hit that nice dose, then of course you do more and then you feel horrible <laughs> afterwards. Right, Cause more is diet. better. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about keto and how you found keto, obviously being in the paleo space, keto really emerged. Um, I, you know, for, for me, I was taught, you know, with some of my mentors like Dr. Dan Pompa, I don't know if you know him, but mm -hmm, he mm -hmm. was teaching the healing diet back in the mid two thousands, which, uh, as I was going through graduate school and I started using that and, you know, our principles were take out grains, change fats, get rid of processed vegetable fats and change the meat that you eat, get rid of grain fed, go with grass fed. And we had, um, kind of a foundation diet that used ancient grains. And then we had kind of the low carb, like this was the healing diet. You do this mm -hmm. for, you know, 30 to 60 days, boom, you really shoot down inflammation. And then of course, um, you know, Dr. Thomas Seyfried, there were some other mm -hmm. different people that came out, Dr. Mercola talking a lot about the ketogenic diet. Um, and how did you get a hold of that and, uh, and start experimenting with that? 
Yeah, it's funny. Even though I'm kind of like the paleo diet guy, I've always eaten a ketogenic diet. Mm, like, uh, if yep. you look at my first book, it, it, it makes a protein recommendation. And, and then the only real specific thing is keep carbohydrates between 30 and 50 grams total per day, particularly for the, for the first 30 days, then you can tinker with reintroducing it. And so I always have felt best around that level. Um, Fortunately, by the time I wrote the the Paleo Solution, I had worked with enough people that I realized keto is awesome for some people and a train wreck for others. But, uh, you know, it, 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 I've tried some different things like Paul Jaminé, the perfect health diet, like he was very geeked out on like safe starches and stuff like that. It was a disaster for me. Like I just felt awful. Yeah. And um if I'm really high motor, like I, I do some old guy Brazilian jujitsu, and if I'm really getting after it, I can maybe get up around a hundred grams of carbs a day on, on those tougher days. Mm -hmm. um, generally though, I'm more like 30 to 50 grams. I, I feel yeah. really good. I really don't track ketones. And I, I think I've been keto adapted so long. My ketone levels are pretty low and I have to do really kind of crazy stuff to get them much higher, but I definitely feel good in those, those areas. And it, it, it's funny over the course of time, I'm not, carnivore but i'm a little carnivore ish yeah. like i've i've really paid attention to what my digestion is like and i i tend to be on the looser side yeah like i seem to get kind of an inflammatory response to certain yeah foods. so you probably do better lower fodmap as a, as a whole yeah yes absolutely absolutely but i'm right. real funny like i i uh when we did a the extensive gut testing and I always get it backwards, like the sulfur producing versus the hydrogen producing hydrogen, and which, yeah. which one makes constipation versus oh, methane, the methane producers. Yeah. The methane. yeah it so, tend to promote constipation. Yep. So I'm over methane producing, but I'm loose. And then uh, Chris, Chris Kresser thought that maybe I had a problem with the, um, uh, an overgrowth of the methane producers very early in the small intestine. And so mm. it was causing this problem. And then we did yeah. testing and, and he's just like, you're just like the toughest <laughs> nut to crack ever. So, um, <laughs> but, but it, the long and short of all that is that I've used different things like FODMAP and, and low yeah. histamine and whatnot. And I just kind of look at what produces really solid digestion for me. Yeah. And yeah. It, it definitely is animal product centric, yeah. Here's something that you might find interesting. When I was eating more plants, if I had bovine dairy, um, I would get acne. Like I, mm. I look like, you know, on yeah. my shoulders. Uh, if I don't eat plants that irritate my gut and loosen the stools, then I can eat dairy with absolute reckless abandon. I'd get yeah. no joint inflammation, no acne. Um, so historically, yeah. I would say I've been dairy intolerant. But then so long as I don't eat plants that irritate me, I can right. eat dairy like crazy, which I, I thought was kind of kind of interesting. But uh, I do a lot of artichokes, um, asparagus, artichokes. Uh, olives, avocados. I do pretty well with, with uh, melons and berries, again, kind of moderating yep. the amount. Uh, mangoes, a little bit of pineapple, but definitely more fruit. And, and I'll do yeah. a little bit of purple sweet potato, but it's a, it's a small amount. But I've just kind of mapped what makes my poo good. Yeah. And then so long as the poo is good, then everything else is good. Yeah. I, I, I just right. try to try to um, max out the Bristol stool chart. And it's so long as I do that, then everything is pretty good. Like my, yep. my lipoproteins and blood lipids are good. My blood sugars are good. Sleep is good. Performance is good. Uh, so, but it, it definitely that keto carnivore ish kind of area is kind of where I've, I've settled and I've done a, a ton of, Tinkering when we were writing Wired Eat, when I was working on it, um, Nikki, my wife, and I would do side by side carb testing. And like I ate 50 grams of effective carbohydrate from rice. She she did the same thing. Yep. She's 40 pounds lighter than I am. And like my blood sugar was almost 200 and hers was like 108 or something, you know. Wow. So, so she it, responded uh, better. Yeah. She responds great. Yeah. Yeah. And she's Italian and I'm a mm -hmm. Northern European and Native American. And that is the totality yeah. of my genetics. Yeah. 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 Really interesting. And so you found that obviously this more of a, a carnivore centric keto style diet tends to work best for you. Yeah. And, um, and so you're not testing ketones, but obviously you've worked with a lot of people as well, helping them get into ketosis. What do you find to be like the biggest mistakes that people are making when it Ooh. comes to actually getting into ketosis? 
even chasing the so if we have a medically supervised ketogenic diet say yeah. if people are using it for adjunctive therapy for like neurodegenerative disease or something like that i think that there's really compelling reasons to track ketones there yeah um, for basic compliance i i think that some tracking can be beneficial but folks get in this more is better game they're like oh right. man i had a 0.5 what can i and then their friend has a 1.5 and they think that somehow their friend is is benefiting more and it's just not the case or at least not always the case so people do squirrely things on ketosis they will um under eat protein and it, mm. they will do that to get elevated ketone levels right. which again under medically some medically supervised scenarios that's a that's a, a good thing but for the vast majority of people just wanting improved health something like a modified actins which is high protein and then low carb and then yep. fat based off of what you need if you have excess mm -hmm. body fat then you don't add a ton of fat to the diet until you lose that body fat then that percentage is going to mm -hmm. go up uh, if you're already pretty lean then you you add more to it um the the under eating protein is a, a huge problem um people doing things like fat bombs again trying to goose their yeah. their ketone levels up i i definitely see a problem it, it's hard to overeat on a ketogenic diet it's pretty satiating mm -hmm. but you see folks where they lose weight and then they start doing squirrely things and then their weight starts yeah. going up you know so you you absolutely can gain weight on a ketogenic diet and it is not the uh the two grams of carbs that are in the cup of whole cream you're eating it's the thousand calories right. that it's in the whole, <laughs> yeah, the whole exactly. cream that you're eating you know you know something um, i used to teach that i've had to go back on over the last several years is this idea of gluconeogenesis and that mm -hmm. you need to you know if you get too much protein there can be issues with certain population groups getting too much protein but you know the idea that too much protein is going to turn into sugar right this idea of gluconeogenesis and throw you out of ketosis um really has been debunked yeah yeah and and you know it's it's funny um one of my heroes in this scene, Dr. Mike Eads, like it, it, their work is just so good, like uh, protein power, protein power, life plan, mm -hmm. like really good stuff. And back from the the early 90s, they they did a lot of, of great, great books and good material. But he has long made this case that, yeah, ketones are good, but just eat a lot of protein. The protein will get converted into glycogen in the liver. And then mm -hmm. the liver will release it in a nice, As steady, even pattern, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. the the Bernstein Diabetes Solution book, which is oriented mm -hmm. mainly towards type one diabetics, but it works for type two diabetics too. It, it's just phenomenal for for managing blood glucose levels in type yeah. one diabetics, which is one of the most difficult metabolic states to manage. And he's very protein centric in that that low carb approach, but um. Uh, too little protein, too much fat, and then um, just generally when people are shifting to a lower carb diet, inadequate electrolytes, specifically sodium, yeah. and and that yeah. was something that I, for twenty years, I didn't get that right, you know. And it was my my good friends Tyler Cartwright and Luis Villasenor who are co-founders with myself in Element that um, I, I asked them to look at what I was doing because I couldn't quite properly fuel my my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu on a, a low carb diet. And they looked at what I was doing. I'm like, man, you need more electrolytes. You need more sodium. I'm like, oh, I salt my food. You know, I'm, I'm good. And it took about a year of me not listening to my coaches before I, I finally just did what they requested of me, which is hit this a minimum of five grams of sodium a day. And it was like a light switch was flipped. Like it was so, so stunning. And I'm, I'm sure that I consumed a fair amount of sodium prior to that. But if you're eating kind of a, a whole food based diet, there's not much sodium in there. You know, when you remove yeah. most processed foods, there's just not a lot of sodium around. So if uh, if you look at a medically supervised ketogenic diet, the, the dietitians that put those together make absolutely certain that people get at least five grams of sodium a day mm -hmm. and the potassium and magnesium and whatnot that they yeah. need. So um, yeah. protein, too much fat, and then inadequate electrolytes, what I would say are like yeah, the three and that's really things. and that's really critical. You talked about sodium. You know, in our society, we're told sodium's bad, causes high mm -hmm. blood pressure, causes you to retain water. And really what the science says is when you're on a high carb diet, like most people are in, in society, you have high insulin. And insulin causes you to retain sodium, 
So in there, in that case, if you're going to continue on a high carb diet, you should be on a low sodium diet. Yeah. Although that's not really healthy. And so uh, it would be better to go low carb. And if you go low carb, you, your insulin levels drop, which reduces inflammation. And then you excrete the sodium. So you actually need more sodium to produce energy. And, um, and when people don't get that sodium, especially in the beginning, when they first start transitioning into a ketogenic diet, a lot of people will experience something called the keto flu, which yeah. typically is related to this issue with uh, just not enough sodium, not enough electrolytes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's funny because I'm a reasonably good biochemist. Like I can, you know, do the metabolic pathways and everything, but um, that it, it's interesting how the ketogenic diet, as it's been kind of released out to the masses, nobody was talking about sodium, not, not in the way that they, they needed to. Um, the, the, the Eads yeah. did a really good job of, of highlighting that. And then my friends, Tyler and Luis, like they, mm -hmm. they really beat that, that drum rather, rather powerfully. And I, when you look at 95% of the problems that people cite with low carb diets, that fatigue, the lethargy, um, you know, kind of brain fog, uh, things that look like adrenal or maybe HPTA axis dysregulation. Yeah. I think it's mainly low sodium, which is a stressor mm -hmm. and does cause some problems uh, uh, with uh, elevated cortisol and, and uh, you know, right. kind of adrenal output. And it's funny, um, al although adrenal fatigue isn't really the term we should use, it should be, I, I guess, HPTA axis dysregulation. But when you look at adrenal recovery protocols, it, first thing in the morning, you take like a teaspoon of salt, you yeah. know, and, and so, yeah, there's some, there's some good science there, but it, it's funny how those really critical pieces, you know, consume yeah. enough sodium on a low carb diet. You just blow past it. Cause you're like protein, carb, fat, like that's all that's important, but yeah. the, the sodium is huge. Yeah. What's interesting is salt is also antihistamine too. Just actually taking oh, some salt, putting it on your tongue. People have allergies, asthma, things like that. They see immediate change. I right? did not know that. Oh, yeah, it has an huh? antihistamine element to it because histamine actually helps to one of the one of the components of histamine is it helps to shunt water into kind of our vital organs. So if our okay. body, if we feel like we're dehydrated, we're going to release more histamine, which prioritizes and triages water into the brain and different areas like that. And sometimes some of these immune symptoms, different issues that are related to histamine. Um, can be associated with dehydration and not getting enough electrolytes. So you just take a little oh, salt, drink water, and a lot of people feel great right afterwards, right? And it knocks out those symptoms. Well, here's an, you, you may be tickled by this. Um, my oldest daughter, uh, we live in central Texas, and the, the cedar fever around here is crazy. Like you're just surrounded by cedar trees. And there are these mm. memes where um, – you know, people are like, oh, it's a gorgeous day today. And it literally looks like a green out. Like it, it, it looks like you're yeah. under like green murky water. And I've noticed my my daughter has a little bit of a, you know, a little cough, a little snarfle. Um, and she will frequently run up to the stove and we have a little ramekin of salt, which will like mm. and just yep. and then take off. And I wonder if she figured out like a little self-medicating on that. That's really interesting, huh? You know, it's interesting. I, my, my parents actually used to have like this, this kind of like salt thing right under, I grew up Jewish and, and my parents had this salt thing right under the table. Apparently it was some sort of a tradition or something like that. And as a kid, I would go under there and lick the salt thing, which kind of sounds gross now, but like my brothers and sisters, we would lick this. Right. So I think it's kind of, and, and animals will seek out salt, right? They're looking for salt all the time. Right. You know, salt used to be worth its weight in gold uh, with our ancestors. So right. like there's this inherent need that we have for salt. And uh, yeah, that, that's the interesting thing. When I looked at Element that you guys sent over, you know, it's high in sodium and most electrolyte powders tend to be much higher in potassium. Right. Yours is real high in sodium based on what you found, particularly with the ketogenic diet and electrolyte needs and, um, you know, with the needs of athletes who are low carb athletes as well. Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting. We definitely need potassium. Like uh, uh, folks oftentimes will think, well, don't you guys think potassium is important? It absolutely is. But what's interesting is when you look at it, like in metabolism, there's this this thing, uh, oxidative priority, like uh, uh, alcohol will get burned before like ketones get burned before fats, but it, you know, and there's this kind of triage of, of how if you put a bunch of nutrients into the body, how they would, one would get burned before the other. And when we're thinking about the, the um, 
kind of the, the priority of electrolytes, if the body gets adequate sodium, the kidneys are really good at sorting out everything else. It'll like keep a little potassium, spit out a little bit of, of calcium. You know, it, it, they just do a great job of sorting what we need so long as we get adequate sodium. If we are low in sodium, the kidneys have a hell of a time dealing with that. And that's where folks will end up in this kind of uh, hyponatremic downward spiral where they will start shedding water and potassium trying mm. to bring sodium levels back to a, a, a relative, you know, balance. And, uh, and that can kill people. So it, yeah. potassium is absolutely important. Folks generally don't get enough of it because we don't eat whole unprocessed foods, but um, it, it's it, ironically, it's more dangerous to have the, the low sodium side of that story than the, the somewhat elevated, um, you know, potassium or, or yeah. the elevated sodium relatively. The, the kidneys will sort that out pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so who's doing great taking the element supplement? Like what, who should be looking at that? Oh man. I mean, I mean, if there was a bullseye right in the middle, I mean like the, the low carb individual ketogenic yeah. athlete, um, people ask free, frequently though, if, if they don't eat low carb, is it still appropriate for them? It, it's interesting. Uh, there was a study and we, we have links to this at drinkelement.com, kind of the science side, it, this stuff is suggestive, but it, we kind of bracket like upper and lower bounds for, for kind of sodium and electrolyte intake. But an interesting study was performed in diabetic heart patients where these folks were tracked. Um, how much electrolyte were they consuming, specifically sodium? And then all-cause mortality was, was uh, both morbidity and mortality was tracked over time. And what was interesting is at the very low levels of intake, two grams or lower, there was very high morbidity and mortality as these sick diabetic heart patients got up to about five grams per day, they hit their low ebb of morbidity and mortality. And then as they started getting higher, they had to get, there was a, it's a U curve, but it's flat on the higher side. They had to get between eight and 10 grams per day to be as likely to suffer morbidity and mortality complications is at two grams per day. So too little sodium was actually far hmm. more dangerous than more yeah. sodium in these these folks so we we kind of a step between that and then what is recommended for a a basic ketogenic diet which is five grams of sodium per day we feel like that's a pretty defensible spot to be for most people uh less than one percent of the the population is a sodium sensitive hyper responder um, these folks will definitely get a very dramatic uh, blood pressure increase with sodium intake, but you already pointed out that is caused by hyperinsulinemia. Those folks right. need to be on a low carb diet and then that's kind of a non-issue. And then when we go over to it and look at like athletic populations, the American Council of Sports Medicine has kind of an upper bound of seven to 10 grams of sodium per day for individuals that are active in heat or in humid environments. So we've got kind of a bracket between like five grams at the low end, maybe seven to 10 grams per day at the higher end. And that really spans kind of the whole population, you know, uh, uh, for sure people eating lower carb or just kind of lower processed foods, they will need to add more sodium to, to deal with that lower insulin environment. Um, but a larger person will need more sodium if you're in a hot or humid environment, you do. And then I, I just kind of learned more about this of late, but uh, folks who are in very cold environments, if the air, if it's so cold that the air is very dry because the moisture has basically been removed from the air, like it's below freezing consistently, you lose huge amounts of water and that can cause a, a dehydration issue. And what's particularly challenging in that scenario is that when people are cold, it suppresses their, their uh, thirst function. So you are just like woefully not thirsty. So that becomes very, very difficult to keep people adequately hydrated. So there's, there's a lot of different scenarios where people benefit from some smart electrolyte supplementation. And it's maybe worth mentioning, if you look in a, a textbook of medical physiology and you look up hydration, hydration is the water and the electrolytes that come with it, it and they're inseparable. Right. But somewhere along the way, hydration became water only, which is yeah. I think part of where we, we got into some, some problems where people are drinking, you know, six, eight glasses of water per day, and they end up having some other kind of wacky health problems, it, it, not the least of which is that that low sodium hyponatremic kind of state. Yeah. So for the listeners out there, definitely really trying to focus on 
more salt, right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. basically getting more of that sodium, some of the best sodium rich foods. I mean, all of your, your meats, grass fed meat, things like that. Celery can be a, a sodium, some, some sort of a sodium source, sea vegetables, seafood in mm -hmm. general, uh, very sodium rich, trace mineral rich, but particularly if you're involved in athletics, um, you know, you're, you're weightlifting, you're doing any sort of like triathlons or running and things like that. Definitely look at some good electrolyte powder and you want one that's high in sodium. The element, we talked about it on the podcast in the past. Definitely check that out. Rob's done a lot of research with his team to formulate the, the right ratio. I think you guys have what is a thousand milligrams of sodium, 2000. Yeah. Yeah, a thousand. Yeah, and then it was like two hundred milligrams of potassium, fifty milligrams of magnesium. Is that correct? That right in the ballpark. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so, and then of course, obviously, you doing uh, jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu, you've noticed big results with this. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, we we had the good fortune to do a a uh, uh, immersive camp in Costa Rica last year, like a, right before COVID started breaking out and um, even in, in uh, you know, January, February uh, in Costa Rica, it's like 95 degrees and it's 90% mm -hmm. humidity. And the place that we were doing jujitsu is a, a, uh, a open air, but um, steel framed building. And you get the sun on one side and it just radiates yeah. the heat. And, uh, you know, folks would get in there and you're wearing a gi. So you're wearing these like big, heavy cotton pajamas right. <laughs> in, in a, a tropical environment. Sweating it out. Sweating it out. And man, you you start cramping, you get fatigued. And so environments like that, I might end up using three or four elements, yeah. getting three or four grams of sodium right. in a two-hour training session, you know. And and with that, without that, man, I, I, I have a heck of a time. We had a guy, big muscular guy that, I mean – I thought he was going to have a heart attack or something like he just kind of like had a full body cramp and uh, we brewed up like kind of a double strength element for him and he started sipping on it. And I mean, it was, you could just kind of like see his muscles unwind. And he, he mm. he's like, I get this cramping every once in a while. Like he's just a really lean muscular guy. And he apparently said that he's always had this kind of cramping issues. He eats very, very clean. And I think he, he uh, probably, didn't really salt his food at all. So he yeah. was eating clean, didn't add any salt, wasn't on his radar to add more, more sodium. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it, you know, clearly I'm self-motivated to tell a good story on that, but I mean, it, it was pretty remarkable to see that guy come back to life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And now cramping itself, like a lot of people will deal with, will suffer with night cramps, leg cramps at night, things like that. You know, normally we're recommending things like magnesium, calcium, but also sodium can be a critical factor yeah. in that too. Yeah, the the sodium actually improves the retention of the magnesium and calcium. So mm -hmm. it's another another situation where you want enough sodium in that story so that it encourages the kidneys to to kind of partition the the other electrolytes in an appropriate way. Yeah. Hmm. Now, if somebody's a coffee drinker too, I've also I've I've been recommending adding some salt to your coffee. Yeah. Um, because coffee has a mild diuretic. Really, any sort of caffeinated beverage is going to have a diuretic function, which is going to cause you to lose some sodium. Mm -hmm. it, we uh, we've tinkered with some things. So within Element, uh, we have a a uh, salted chocolate, yeah. and what folks have been doing is putting that in some of their coffee. Okay, and that's been yeah. kind of a, a slick workaround. And I mean, some people apparently, oh gosh, who was it? Um, Somebody mentioned recently that in the Navy, there is this tradition, I had no idea about this, but there is this tradition of, uh, you know, like on a, on a naval ship, you know, modern Navy ship, but apparently since, since quite, quite a long time, that there's always kind of a ramekin of salt out and that the sailors would take a big pinch of salt and throw it in their coffee. And there, mm. there was, uh, that people just felt better. And, and, uh, yeah. and that was part of the, you know, I guess, in addition to the, the ocean water, but like the, you know, that guy is salty or whatever, you know, related yeah. to the, the salt consumption. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how salt has been demonized, right? And we realize it is absolutely so critical, like worth its weight in gold. So for the listeners out there, that means if you had a pound of salt, you literally could trade that for a pound of gold 
many years ago because salt was so revered because you could preserve food, mm -hmm. um, right? So it would, allow, it would allow you to to have food that would last longer. People naturally, because they were preserving food in it, would consume more, right? Because right. things were salted. In fact, every culture out there has salted foods, right? Yeah. Smoked and salted and things like that. All It was just something that we've always done. And then, you know, somewhere along the lines, you know, our, our scientists and, and nutrition researchers started coming out and saying, we need to avoid salt. And I guess it had to do with processed foods and things like that, but um, really not good substantial research on that. Yeah, definitely a guilt by association. And like you, yeah. you really laid out, I, I think the mechanism there, um, processed food usually means processed carbs. It tends to be hyper palatable. So we eat right. like never ending amounts of it. And it tends to have sodium with it too, but it wasn't really the I wouldn't say that sodium was making that situation better, but it wasn't the cause of the whole catastrophe going yeah. on for sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Now, is there a particular salt brand or like, so if somebody wants to salt their foods better uh, along with taking the element, do you like Redmond's real salt, Himalayan sea salt? Is there a particular salt that you found that works better? I'm kind of a knuckle dragger on that. Like I, I yeah. just kind of like whatever salt that, that folks so like, like. iodized salt. That's fine. I, I, you know, if uh, within this this modern world where we have a lot of people developing, it, it, it's tough because um, there's a remarkable number of people developing, say, like Hashimoto's. And in that context where uh, uh, that iodized sea salt can actually worsen that thing or at least per perpetuate right. nodules and stuff like that. So that's a tough thing. But then when you look at where else are people getting iodine out of the diet? Nobody's eating like sweet breads, you know, like the thymus mm -hmm. gland of, right. or, 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 or and thyroid gland. Um, too far, too few, few people are eating seafood or seaweed. So I'm kind of, I'm almost mm -hmm. in that spot where I'm like ah, a little bit of I, you know, like maybe take a, a, some iodized salt and maybe take some some regular salt and just have two different shakers in the house and maybe you mix them up a little bit because I I do feel like a lot of folks are probably not getting enough iodine also. Mm. And interestingly, like in like paleo diet communities, if the person doesn't eat seafood, there's not a lot of iodine yeah. source in, in those True. foods, you know? Yeah, yeah. True, yeah. Seaweed, I'm a huge fan of adding seaweed, right? Yep. Just, just, you know, basically using it, dulce, kelp, stuff like that, putting that on you know, as kind of a garnish on different yep. foods. I think that's a really good idea. Let's talk about uh, your new book, Sacred Cow. And you also just came out with a movie on that as well. So we'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Uh, this was maybe an attempt at career suicide. Like we, <laughs> we, my, my co-author and I, Diana Rogers, we've been talking about a book that looks at uh, kind of regenerative agriculture and animal husbandry and, when you poke around on the interwebs and the topic of like meat consumption pops up or, or veganism, the, it, the, there's kind of a game of whack-a-mole that gets played. And usually the conversation will start off with, well, meat causes cancer and, and meat will give you diabetes and whatnot. And in the process of kind of unpacking that, then usually the conversation shifts to, well, it's unethical to eat animals. And there's some some back and forth on that. It, it, it's interesting when you start really thinking about um, optimum human health just as a standalone, like the, the whole ethics thing takes on a really different story. Like if, uh, if it's impossible for children and pregnant mothers to really it, developing children to get adequate nutrition without animal products, it, it changes the ethics conversation pretty pretty dramatically. And then, of course, the environment, like uh, uh, people are very concerned about climate change. And there's a lot of discussion around, um, you know, that like the methane emissions from cattle are, are single handedly going to destroy the planet. And again, it's like a game of whack-a-mole, like you address one topic and then the people will change the uh, gears and, and address something else. So Diane and I wrote this book to to look at the ethical, environmental and health considerations of a meat inclusive food system. So everything from the way that food is produced to the way it's it's shipped and transported, what the implications are for our our medical and healthcare systems. Uh, when we turned the book in, it was over 660 pages, I want to say, and it got whittled down to about 280, about 300 with with references. I I I think it's very readable. Like I, I'm really proud of that book. It, it mm -hmm. does a pretty good job of of laying out the 
the case and you know the the environmental piece is maybe the the hottest topic right now although it seems like about every six months there's kind of a vegan backed film you know like what the health and cowspiracy yeah. and things like mm -hmm. that 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 pop up but right now the the environmental piece is really hot and heavy and there's a lot of discussion like um uh raising animals uh consumes too much water and when we, we we're really looking at grazing animals very specific like when you talk about chicken and pork i would actually say that a, a number of the environmental gripes have a lot more merit because even a conventionally raised cow spends 70 percent of its life on grass and then it's only grain finished near near the end right um so it wouldn't be that much work to shift that to a, a completely mm -hmm. kind of grass finished uh, kind of process but what's interesting about that story is when we look at the the resources allocated to producing say like soybeans versus a pound of beef or what have you um when that that beef allocation is considered there's three different types of water that we need to to look at and within environmental circles there's green water blue water and gray water the green water is what falls on the land either as rain snow mist you know some type of precipitation Blue water includes lakes, rivers, streams, and to some degree below ground aquifers. And then gray water is kind of the leftover product of say like animal husbandry or, or food man, you know, processing or what have you. When folks look at the water consumed in producing a pound of beef, they include the water that grows grass on open plains basically. Yeah. And they present it as if that water is being used for something that we could use it somewhere else. And it, it's just mm -hmm. not accurate. And even in conventional animals, about 94, 95% of the water in conventional animals is green water. It's water that was going to fall on the earth. It was going to water grass. And, and there's really not, and, and you want that to happen. Like you want healthy, vibrant grasslands like that. That is definitely something that you want. Um, 100% pastured meat that pops up to about 96, 98%, you know, that the bulk of the water used is from green water sources. Uh, when you compare and con contrast that then with what is, is put into things like wheat and soybeans and whatnot, it's kind of eye-opening. Like it, 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 it's kind of a statistical manipulation that really makes meat look like a, a water hog or something that is mm -hmm. disproportionately you know, um, uh, thirsty for, for uh, resources. Another topic that gets shot around a lot and it's very controversial is the greenhouse gas emissions from, from ruminant animals like, like cattle. There was a claim that has taken on this life of its own that 38% of all greenhouse gas emissions from the United States are from cattle. The real number is closer to about 2% of, of total greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but this thing is just like out in the wild. Like there, there are documentary films that cite this yeah. or papers that, that cite this kind of erroneous number. And even within that story, it's really important to, to get this piece right. The greenhouse gas emissions that occur from life are, are part of a cycle. Like you and I right. being alive right now are greenhouse gas emitters. Mm -hmm. Like when we breathe that yeah. that's, we're, we're releasing carbon dioxide. Um, definitely cattle produce methane as, as part of the cellulosic fermentation of, of eating, you know, greenery and, yeah. and grass and converting it into food. And methane is a more potent greenhouse gas, a, a, you know, item versus uh, carbon dioxide, but it only has about a 10 year lifespan in the atmosphere. When it gets exposed to the environment and ultraviolet radiation, it tends to get cleaved into uh, uh, hydrogen and carbon dioxide and then that, that and or water uh, production directly. And then that carbon ends up being taken up by plants and becomes you know, the, the, the next cycle right. of food that is produced that is eaten by animals. And where this gets really dangerous, um, when we start demonizing biogenic sources of greenhouse gases like methane, then when we look at the fact that termites produce massive amounts of greenhouse gases, hmm. uh, it was recently discovered that shellfish on the ocean floor produce absolutely prodigious amounts of greenhouse gases. 
and we've we're training a population to be very um, prickly at the notion that the idea that all greenhouse gases are are bad. So people are suggesting that we should eradicate termites and and wow. shellfish to save the planet. <laughs> And, wow. and this is where it, it really gets crazy. And uh, I, I don't know if I'm helping to really explain kind of the, the, the background of the book, but it's an incredibly nuanced and complex topic. And, and we're in this, this period of time where um, uh, sound bites really kind of win the day. Uh, right. uh, this notion that um, holistically managed regenerative agriculture might actually be good for the environment is actually one of these topics that the, the big tech overlords We'll, we'll censor that material like that, wow. that that gets kind of the the fake news deal at, at certain times not yeah. always but not not infrequently so um i know i didn't give a massive uh, treatment to to all that material but i i would definitely encourage folks to at least entertain the possibility that the the current narrative that animal husbandry is just uniformly injurious to the environment and that uh, like growing meat in a lab or, or, you know, these things like impossible burger yeah. or somehow better sustainability options. Like I, I, I don't think the science really supports that at all. Yeah, totally in agreement with that. You know, it's interesting because um, I have twin boys that are five and we're watching the lion King. So mm -hmm. we're uh, going through the lion King. The lion King is all about the cycle of life. Right. Right. And it's all about how, you know, basically these animals here, um, you know, serve the, the the land with this, you know, and, and Mufasa talks about how when he dies, you know, he ends up becoming the grass and then mm -hmm. the antelope eat the grass, right? And it's kind of this whole regenerative agricultural standpoint. And um, I think that's really, you know, a big thing that you talk about in your book and that a lot of great farmers are out there doing. A lot mm -hmm. of these smaller farms are doing it right where they've got, you know, certain they're grazing and they've got animals that they're rotating in that nourish the land. And then, you know, the cows come in, they eat the grass, they poop, the, the manure helps nourish the land. And it's kind of a whole process. And it's really the cycle of life. And it's, you know, nature at its finest. And, uh, you know, of course, with with we have this big push by really industrial companies, right? More or less like food companies, chemical companies that are trying to manipulate that and say that it's, you know, has to do with saving the world and, um, you know, obviously saving the planet and um, climate change. Right. And I think that your, your story and, and everything that you're talking about there really uh, is a great counter to that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, Forbes had a really interesting piece that they had, that the headline was something to the effect of veganism is no friend of the environment. And it basically made the case that um, there are six companies that that produce 95% of the food that we eat on this planet. Yeah. And uh, what we're what is being suggested with this very plant centric model is um, that we should double down on that, that even less of our food should be like locally sourced right. and and not some sort of intellectual property that's owned by a multinational corporation. And they, they made the case that uh, none of this stuff is particularly sustainable. Like uh, all of the, the, the row crop centric model is dependent on synthetic fertilizer. And people right. will say, well, we can use organic fertilizer. And it's like, well, where do you get that? You either get it from animals grazing on that area or, yeah. or you do crazy things like uh, uh, people are currently taking seaweed from coastal areas, trucking it inland for thousands of miles to feed it to cows because it reduces <laughs> their methane production a tiny bit. And it, it, if people are curious about this, I would encourage them to look up at this concept called a life cycle analysis. And it's basically this full accounting of all the inputs, all the outputs that go into different systems. And a, a good example of this is ethanol that is ostensibly produced as a, a fuel alternative. But what's interesting is ethanol farmers, corn farmers don't run their tractors on ethanol because it takes more fuel to produce it than what you get out of it. And so when wow. there are claims around sustainability like if uh, if you're not getting more out of the system than than what was was put into it, then it, it's a net sink, you know. And in these biodynamic, grass centric, animal centric models um, are uh, produce enormous amounts of food, 
they they can exist for for thousands of years. There are, are grass centric farms in uh, in the UK that that have a, a, a chain of ownership that goes back uh, two three thousand years, and yep. and they're grazing animals in the same areas, and they haven't you you know destroyed it. Um, so there there are some interesting opportunities to really improve our our food systems, and I think there's an opportunity to plug that into our current distribution channels too, like. As much as people may rail against things like Costco and and uh, Walmart and whatnot, man, logistically, the, the, it's pretty amazing how they're able to move something from point A to point B. Wouldn't it be cool if we could produce more food at a local level and then plug into the distribution channels that are at the the more you know decentralized level and move the things around that that we need to move around, but but ultimately consume more of our food local. Yeah, I think it's a really important message. Um, I think, you know, we, we really have to go back to doing what's right for the land and uh, monocropping, you know, this massive, you know, huge farms, huge scale farms, just growing, you know, soybeans and corn um, is actually stripping the land, right? Yep. And they're stripping the land of the nutrients. We've lost, you know, a good level of our topsoil. And the great thing about regenerative farming is it actually adds back. And like you said, the life cycle of the farm is so much better. And, and you can actually take land. Like I have friends that have a farm and they've taken the land and they've by rotating the different animals in a certain way, right? They've actually added topsoil, added nutrients to the soil. And we think about from a health perspective, we just know, we know that people are, are nutrient deficient. We're not getting the nutrients mm -hmm. from our food the way that we should be. And this really solves multiple, you know, several different problems, right? It's obviously going to be great for our nutrition going back to this way of farming. Uh, but then also, like you mentioned, also very, very good for the environment, reducing the amount of chemicals, reducing, um, you know, just adding more, more nutrition to the soil makes, yep. makes the land healthier. So a lot of great benefits to that. So where, where can people find out more is your book in bookstores everywhere? Obviously they can go to Amazon and get it sacred cow. Yep. And also and tell us about your movie too. Yeah. Uh, sacred cow info is where you can learn all about the, the book, the film. Um, there's a ton of material on there, like outtakes from the film and the, the film is really beautiful. And again, my, my co-author and uh, in theory, I'm the executive producer of the film, but yeah, Diana Rogers is really the person <laughs> that spearheaded all of this stuff. She is just the most amazing woman, uh, uh, such a hard worker and has sacrificed so much to get this project out. And uh, I think as of yesterday of uh, us recording this, the film is available pretty much everywhere via, via you know, online download, uh, Amazon, uh, Hulu, all right. those different outlets. But again, sacredcow.info is where you can learn more about both the, the book and the film. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I want to encourage the listeners to go out, definitely get the book and also share it, share the book, share, share the movie. Um, people need to know about this. There's a lot of other films coming out. Uh, you mentioned a few of them that are really promoting more of this, you know, vegan industrialized kind of model. And uh, we really need this sort of thing to go viral, right? We yep. need people to be seeing this information, reading this book, uh, watching this movie. And uh, that way we, cause we have a compelling argument, you know, the science is really on our side here. Uh, we just need the exposure. So, yes. you know, our listeners of this show, you know, we can, we can get that information out. So Rob, thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Any last words, inspiration for our audience? No, just thank you so much for, for having me on. Been a big fan of your work for a long time. And I, I know we have some interesting uh, in real life, uh, you know, commonalities there. So it's, it's great mm -hmm. to spend some time with you and thank you. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate that guys. So go out, get the book and we'll see you guys on a future podcast. Be blessed everybody.